your power. Show us your glory this morning, God. Without you, we have nothing. Oh, Lord, we stand in awe of you this morning. We stand in awe of you. Pour yourself out on your church. Pour yourself out on your church. We have had five months of being away from gathering corporately like this. And I've had a few conversations this week regarding 
what I'm going to say right now. But I've really felt that, and I know a lot of you have felt very dry, parched, discouraged, frustrated. And sometimes that presents itself in a tiredness that's a physical tiredness when it's very much a spiritual tiredness. And so as we gather here this morning, I ask you to just kind of be alert to that. Make that more, more in the forefront of your mind so that you open yourselves up to receive what God has for you today. Some of it is our own doing. Some of it, it all of it's our own doing, I guess. But, you know, sometimes it happens and we don't even realize it's happening. But we're dry spiritually. And God wants nothing more than for you to come into his presence this morning and just to soak and absorb all that is him. He wants to refresh you. He wants to fill you up. And that is up to us. We need to be ready to receive this morning. So as we worship, if you know the words, sing along. We're allowed to sing. Thank God we're allowed to sing here this morning. And if you don't know the words and, and you have to look at the screen, that's fine too. Or just close your eyes and get lost in his presence and let him do a work in your heart through the worship and the word. Use this time. We need to never, ever take for granted, again, the ability to come together corporately and worship as a body. It is so important. It is, it's biblical. And so we need to take advantage of every moment this morning. So God, we pray, just have your way here this morning. Touch every heart. Fill every dry and thirsty place right now in Jesus' name. God, we know that you want to do great things. And we know the enemy intends to distract and throw us off course, but we rebuke him this morning in the name of Jesus. We know, we know that we will see the enemy run when we lift our praises to you this morning. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. day remains Jesus this we know we will see the enemy run this we know we will see the victory come we hold on to every promise you
Hi, it's good to be with you again. We trust you enjoyed our time of worship, and uh, we uh, trust that this word will encourage you as you uh, watch the service here online today. We are uh, just in our fifth Sunday today, gathering together in person, and it's been a very rich time. And I want to really encourage you, uh, if you're able to, that you would join us, be here in person. There are just some special things that the Lord is doing, and I think some things that He's working in our heart by way of strength and faith and renewal that is in preparation for maybe even some challenging times that are ahead. So I encourage you, if you're able, to be with us in person. It really is a special time to be together. You know, I've been reading uh, my quiet time in the book of Ruth this past little while, and uh, if you've read the story, you'll know that the story begins with uh, two women named Naomi and Ruth, who, are, are, who both had their husbands pass away during a time of famine when they lived in the land of Moab. And they decide that they're going to go back to Israel, to the town of Bethlehem, which actually means house of bread. But what's interesting is the response of these two women to that difficult time. For example, upon arriving, we know that Naomi, whose name means pleasant, that she changes her name to Mara in, in chapter 1, verse 20. And the reason she does this is because in her view, she says, the Almighty has made my life bitter. And that's what the word Mara or the name Mara means. It means bitter. In other words, what Naomi is saying is that she believes that God is sovereign, that God, of course, can do what he wants. And so if he can change things for the better, but apparently in her situation has chosen not to, then her misery is actually part of his will. That was her perspective. But we see Ruth, on the other hand, although she too believes in God's sovereignty, she believes that God is almighty, that he can do whatever it is he wants to do, but she understands that actually what he wants is for his people to lay hold of all the possibilities that he has for them because of the fact that he is sovereign. And so we see two different perspectives in these women who came from the same situation, and as you read the story, two dramatically different outcomes. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, which is our text this morning, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 12 through to 19, he said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been taken by storm and eager men are forcing their way into it. And of course, what he's talking about is the fact that there are certain things in life that you must force yourself to go after or they're simply not going to happen. It doesn't matter how sincere you may be. It's just not going to happen if you don't force yourself to lay hold of those things. And now he's not talking about just sheer human willpower, but he's talking about, like in the case of Ruth, he's talking about the willingness to choose that thing that God has made possible to happen. Your will comes into play by making up your mind to move into what it is that God has made available for you. Jesus then continues to talk about this mindset of that person, and I would say even as a church congregation, this mindset of people who actually choose to live in anticipation of the new things God has for them. He says in verse 13, For before John came, all the prophets and the laws of Moses looked forward to this present time. And if you are willing to accept what I say, he is Elijah, the one the prophets said would come. Now, the way what he's saying is the way that you receive what God has for you is being by willing to be uh, to accept what it is that he says to you. Let me say that again. The way you receive what it is that God has for you is by being willing to accept what Jesus says to you. He said all the prophets and the law of Moses looked forward to this present time. Here's what I think he means. He was saying to them, listen, you've had the word of God all this time. You know what the Word of God says. You know what the prophets have foretold. You know what they pointed to. What they said was going to happen when Messiah finally was in your midst. And then Jesus goes on to say, What I am telling you is that what you always thought was going to happen tomorrow, it's happening today. What I'm telling you is the prophecies, the words, the truths that you are so accustomed to, that you've been taught since you were a child, that you, that you know very well, but you always think of as being futuristic, being another time, those things are taking place today. You are living in fulfilled prophecy. And then Jesus says, the man who has ears to hear must use them. 
Now, Jesus said that oftentimes, and essentially what he means is this. Just because you hear words doesn't mean that you're hearing what is actually being said. So if you have ears, then hear this. And I believe it's a very relevant word for today. First of all, that we recognize that what Jesus and the prophets said would happen before his second coming or actually happen today. The things that Jesus and the prophets of old foretold thousands of years ago, things that many of us have grown up hearing, things that many of us have, have been used to hearing preached, we've even talked about it ourselves. Jesus said, listen, I want you to understand these things are beginning to unfold today. There's no more just, you know, someday in the future that will happen. No, there's no more tomorrow. Tomorrow is today. And along with that, I believe the Lord would also say we need to recognize that we have been called to possess today what it is that he has promised to do in his people in preparation for those times that we are moving into. Once again, when it comes to the promises of God, when it comes to the things that he prophesied that he would do, for example, we know the scripture very well. A Peter quote in the book of Acts, quoting the prophet Joel, saying, In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. There would be prophecy, there would be dreams and visions. Every age, every demographic, God would pour out his spirit in these last days. He says, listen, there's no more tomorrow. I want you to begin to move today in what it is that I'm doing. And what I want to do in your life and in your midst in preparation for what is to come. Set into motion now what God is saying to you. I believe that's what the Lord is saying to us. And walk with him toward their fulfillment. Because tomorrow, I believe, we're seeing unfold today. Now Jesus continues in verse 16. But how can I show what the people of this generation are like? They are like children sitting in a marketplace calling out to their friends. We played at weddings for you, but you wouldn't dance. And we played at funerals, and you wouldn't cry. For John came in the strictest austerity, and people say he's crazy. Then the Son of Man came, enjoying life, and people say, look, a drunkard and a glutton. The bosom friend of a tax collector and the sinner. Wisdom stands or falls by her own actions. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that God's wisdom will visibly be seen living in the lives of those who actually embrace his wisdom, embrace what it is that he says. It will prove itself. Now, there are, I have found, essentially two words that describe every human culture of every generation. And those two words are repetition and complacency. Repetition and complacency. Every culture in every generation is essentially repetitious. What I mean by that, for example, is you'll hear some people say, well, the church is repetitious. You go to church, it's just the same thing all the time. It's, it's boring, it's liturgical, it's repetitious. But the fact of the matter is that our culture itself is much more repetitious than anything that you see in the church. It's much more predictable. It's just new variations on the same old thing for any of us who've lived any period of time. In fact, we all know very well that if your clothes are out of style, there's no point in giving them away. Just box them up, put them in your closet, because in a few years' time, they're all going to be back in style. This generation, this culture, is predictable. That's why people use terms like the grind, Monday to Friday. There's always new things in the sense of novel things, but it's just the same things repackaged over and over again that don't satisfy. Our culture is repetitious. It's predictable. And Jesus also addresses complacency. He said in verse 16, How can I show what the people of this generation are like? And what he means by generation is not a, a particular age demographic. He's talking about a mindset. He's saying, do what do I compare these people who, who think this way? Then he says, they're like children playing games. And he recites a song that some suggest was actually probably sung in his day. And the song was, we played at weddings for you, but you wouldn't dance. And we played at funerals, and you wouldn't cry. 
And what Jesus is talking about, I believe, is he's describing a generation that's just going through the motions, but nothing changes. Nothing ever really gets done. Why? Because passive people never possess what it is that God has for them. Passive people never really lay hold of new things and new opportunities. And I believe in the body of Christ, the question that we all face is whether today is just a repetition, just a reenactment of yesterday, just the same old thing, or is today a laying hold of tomorrow? That really is the challenge for all of us who follow Christ and for all of us who live in this day. Now, this generation that Jesus talks about is made up of people, he said, who are just shaped by this, this sense of redundancy. They're just shaped by this spirit of passivity, and it tempts all of us. And so the question is, the question I want us to consider as believers in these days in which we live, in which there's a lot of repetition, a lot of new things, but a lot of the same old things, and yet a day in which the Lord wants to do something new in us and do something new in and through his church, the question becomes, am I a part of this generation that Jesus spoke about, that Jesus was criticizing? What kind of generation, what kind of mindset is it exactly that Jesus was speaking about here? And how is it that he wants to counter that, that mindset in me so that I can actually begin to lay hold of new things that he has for me, that he's speaking to me about, rather my life just being a repetition, a reenactment of what I've always done. Rather than there being a complacency, there is actually, again, that sense of pressing in, that sense of, of going after who God is and what he is doing. What are some of the traits of this generation, this mindset that Jesus wants me to break out of? Well, if I could talk uh, on, on just a church level, the first one that comes to my mind, I believe, is a generation that is used to what you might say sermons, but is not used to being shaped by God. You know, one of the things that concern me in the body of Christ today is that there's, there's, uh, there seems to be a real tendency to give a, a lot of emphasis on motivational speaking, or, or it just seems that everybody ha has a life coach. And a lot of pastors, I think, today are increasingly becoming that way as well. And because of that, our focus becomes, well, you know, I want preaching that's, that's interesting. I want preaching that's inspiring. And that's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that you preach well if you put people to sleep. We can certainly inspire and encourage people. But yet, as a believer, you need to understand, according to the Word of God of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that God's Word is alive. God's Word is full of living power. God's Word will encourage me, but it also challenges me. It convicts me, and it changes me. God's Word is intended to reshape the way I think, the way I behave. It's meant to shape and, and impassion me for new things that God is doing to hear a, a fresh word from Him and to move into these new things that he's speaking to me about. I believe another aspect of this generation Jesus warns us about is a generation that's unwilling to bury the old life. Jesus, I think, is referring to people who say, you know, I believe in God and I want salvation and I want a new life. But then when the Lord comes to it, he says, listen, okay, but you need to bury the old life. There are some things that you need to put to death once and for all. That's what it means to pick up our cross. Oftentimes, he's met with opposition or a hesitation on our part. I wonder how many people there are who have been Christians for a number of years in the church, and yet they've never been baptized in water, for example. How many Christians are there who've been baptized in water, but they've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit? They consider that to be an optional thing, whereas Jesus says, not only is it a promise for you, but it is absolutely necessary for you as a child of God to serve him in the power that we need to serve him in and live for him in these days in which we live. We need to bury the old life. And the reason I ask that question is because, you know, we never are going to move into the new things that God has for us while we're holding on to the old life. Let me say that again. We're never going to move into new things as long as we're holding on to the old life. And that really ties into this next trait of this generation or this mindset that Jesus warns us about. Number three, that is a generation that wants healing but doesn't want deliverance. 
What I mean by that is that, is that I essentially believe that in any area of our life where there needs to be healing, it is always attached to something else in our life. Now, I'm not talking about physical healing, although we know that there are people who are physically sick and it's connected to maybe a spirit of unforgiveness or bitterness, things that are, that are hurting them from the inside out. People who want their health back, but they're not willing to deal with their heart. We know that's a reality. Uh, people like that will often say, God, I really want help in a particular part of my life, or I really want help in my relationship. I want that to change, or I want my finances to change. But Jesus knows that he can't just deal with the symptoms. If he's actually going to get rid of that problem, he's got to deal with the root. He has to go a lot deeper. He wants to break that stronghold at its root in order that we're free once and for all. And in order for that to happen, in order for there to come the real freedom that Jesus spoke about, that, that the real deliverance, the abundant life that Jesus spoke about, there has to come deliverance. And that deliverance comes by allowing the Holy Spirit and His presence to enter into our life. You see, He's not going to force His way in. But if you will reach out to Him by the force of your own will, of your own decision to lay hold of Him, he says, then deliverance will begin to work its way in your heart. But it only begins, Jesus said, if you're willing to accept what I say. You have to decide to let him deal with the root. And so let me just stop there for a moment and ask you, are you part of that generation that Jesus warned about? That generation that maybe listens to sermons, but is not really shaped by the word of God. That generation that is unwilling to bury the old life, that wants the new things that God talks about, but you won't let go of the old things. Are you part of that generation that wants healing, that wants change, but won't allow the Holy Spirit to do deep surgery and actually work a freedom, a deliverance that deals with the issue and not just the symptoms? Jesus also spoke about a generation that keeps putting off what it is that God wants us to put on, what he wants us to add to our lives. You know, there's probably not a day that goes by that I don't have to consciously decide whether or not I'm going to eagerly go after what it is that God is speaking to me about, or whether I'm just going to remain apathetic and say, oh, well, I know it's something the Lord's talked to me about, but, but I'll get to it some other time. Is that my response? Or is there an eagerness in my heart that says, thank you, Lord, for showing me that. And I begin to pursue that thing. You know, I would never say that about my salvation. The Bible says, if you hear the Lord speaking to you, today is the day of salvation. Don't put that off. And yet I need that same attitude in those things the Lord is showing me in these days in which I'm living, those things the Holy Spirit is dealing with me about what he wants to grow in me. I have to have that same attitude about change because the Lord has not called me to a faith that's just safe and stagnant. He calls me to a faith, he says, that is new every day. There's a newness in me. There's a depth that's growing in me because there's this spiritual formation that's taking place in my life as I allow the Holy Spirit to grow me. Another trait of that generation, I believe in these days in which we live, and it's very pertinent in the church in these days, is a generation that's confused about signs and wonders, confused about the miraculous. You know, there are some people in church circles who, who don't like those words, signs and wonders, don't really like talking about that, not too comfortable with that, because they've convinced themselves somehow that, that those people, those Christians who, who want to see miracles, they're just looking for a show. And you know, some may be. But that attitude is not limited to people who believe in or desire to see signs and wonders. There are just as many Christians who are also attracted to the show. They're attacked, attracted to church programs. They're attracted to church packaging. They're attracted to a church where they can kind of just sit back and everything's done well and everything is done on time and, 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 and there's people there who will take care of them and take care of their families. They just need to sit back. They just spectate. Jesus said that people who take the kingdom by storm are people who aren't just looking for a thrill, but they're people who recognize their need for the power of God. 
There are people who recognize the need to see the love of God in action in a way that's just not a, a syrupy emotion that makes people feel better, but actually changes lives. They want to see the power of God to deliver and to heal and to transform people's lives forever. And they don't just spectate, but they participate in what God is doing, what God has called them to, because they want the life of Jesus to happen through them to those who are around them. Is that the generation you're part of? Is that your heart's desire? Jesus also warned of a generation that would only seek to be happy. That very much is our culture today. It's all about momentary happiness, a new, a new thrill, whether it's social media and likes and posts or, or just things that we purchase, whatever it may be, entertainment. It's all about just that momentary sensation of feeling happy. Let me be clear, the Bible says in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God, it is, it's all about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. But it's not just talking about fun and fellowship. You see, there's a sense of joy. There's a deep, settled sense of peace that happens in a person's life when you know that God is doing something in your life. When you know that God is active, when there's something deliberate that he's speaking to you about, that he's walking you through, that he's actually growing in you. And then when he begins to actually pour that something through your life into somebody else, well, there comes a, a joy, there comes an exhilaration that really surpasses any momentary pleasure, any momentary amusement that the world offers. The Lord wants it to be a people who who lay hold forcibly of the things that he has for us, the things that he's calling us to, because he knows that there is a joy and a fulfillment that is only found in walking with him, that's only found in allowing him to, to, to be in and through us everything that he's gifted us to be and to know. And then finally, Jesus, I believe, is speaking about a generation that debates the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And I'm speaking primarily to believers right now, of course. You know, I've found over many years of being in ministry, many years of walking the Lord, that, that the real issue in the church at large has never been whether or not the baptism with the Holy Spirit is biblical. It's never been whether or not the baptism with the Holy Spirit or speaking in other tongues or the gifts of the Spirit, whether or not they're ready for today. All that debate is just a theological smokescreen. The real issue has always been that people often resist what they cannot control. That's really what the whole debate is about. It's not a, about scripture, it's not about interpretation, it's very clear what Jesus promised, what Jesus has for us by way of that experience today. It's just whether or not we're able to control him. You see, Jesus said that the kingdom of God comes in power, but you have to decide whether or not that power is just an option to you or whether you want God to release in and through your life the very same thing that he released through the lives of those who actually changed the world when the church first began. And they changed the world through this apostolic message and this mission that came as a result of experiencing the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, only you can decide whether you're open to that or not. But taking the kingdom of God by storm at any level in our lives. Hear me, friends, it's never a smooth, tidy process. Theologically, you might be able to put that in some compartment and, and think you've got it figured out. But when the kingdom of God is actually happening in your life, breaking forth through your life, it's never going to be just a tidy, neat little process. It's going to shake you up. It's going to rattle you. It's going to change you. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 4 that when the disciples were forbidden by the religious authorities of, of their day to speak and to teach the name of Jesus, what did they do? They got together and they prayed. And their prayer was, Lord, listen to their threats to harm us. Empower us to speak the word of God freely and courageously. And then the Bible says after they prayed that prayer, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled again with the Holy Spirit. And they were empowered to go back into the streets, back into the synagogues, and to preach the word of God boldly 
and to see signs and wonders and miracles follow the preaching of the word. I want to close this morning by simply asking you this question. Is there anything inside of you that says, don't let Jesus have his way? Don't expect tomorrow to be any different than today. If that spirit of passivity is ruling you so that your today is just a reenactment of yesterday or your tomorrow is just some distant thought that never really happens, just you're always putting things off or it's always another day, then I want to encourage you this morning to say, Jesus, Listen to those words. Listen to those threats. Listen to those lies and empower me. Empower me to confront them. And if you'll do that, by the Holy Spirit, he will begin to shake things up. He will meet you. You will encounter. He will begin to set you back on mission. The Lord's so faithful to do that. You see, friends, I already believe with all my heart that things that were foretold by Jesus and the prophets thousands of years ago are beginning to unfold before our very eyes today. But you know what? So are his promises. His promise to those who will lay hold, who will, who will take the promises of God by force. That is, by the force of their decision. The Lord is also beginning to bring alive again his promises, his anointing, his empowering upon his people who are waking up because they're making that decision. The power is God's, but the determination to possess it is ours. And that process, that choice, is what begins to set things in motion today. But you have to make that choice. You have to reach out and take it. And I believe there's an urgency in what the Spirit of God is saying to the church today because he wants us to understand that tomorrow is today. Those things that he prophesied years ago concerning the last days, the days leading up to his return. He says, open your eyes and see those things that you always thought were another day tomorrow. They're happening today. But so is the moving of the Spirit. So are the promises of God, the things that he wants to do in and through you, but you have to lay hold of them by the power of your own choice. And the Lord says those promises will be yours today. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you are doing in these days. And Father, even with some of the confusion and the challenges that are before us, we recognize that these are things, as your word says, that should not take us by surprise, for you told us of these things. We don't need to be fearful, don't need to be afraid, don't need to be concerned, but we do need to be alert, we do need to be awake. Lord, I thank you that even though the things that we saw, thought maybe we were far off are beginning to unfold today, so are your promises, O oh Lord, to fill us, to empower us. Lord, to do a work in our hearts and in your church that is able to rise up, Lord. You are raising up a people today in response to what has taken place that we might not only meet the challenge for our own sake, but Lord, that we can penetrate the darkness. We can lay hold of your promises for people today who are looking for an answer, who are looking for salvation, who are looking for healing, for miracles, who are looking for the way. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing today. And I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would simply help us to lay hold of what it is, to take it by force, Lord, what it is that you have before us, to resist that spirit of our, of our age, of apathy and unbelief. Lord, that faith rise up within us to lay hold of today, Lord, what you would have for us, that, Lord, we can serve you and minister to others, Lord, with love and with faith and with boldness. And so we commit ourselves to you today in Jesus' name. Amen.